I'm Walter Isaacson, and I have the great pleasure of being along for the ride with everybody here at the Aspen Institute. This has been a totally amazing event with really some wonderful, provocative panels, talks, convenings, and I hope in the spirit of this that the, pro the provocative thoughts lead to really great actions and that all of us can go forth from here with great projects and great action plans for how we're going to revise our ways of putting a dent in the universe. It's particularly uh, interesting for me to be able to talk about the theme that uh, is the theme of this year's Action Forum, which is collaborative leadership. Because on the side, I'm a biographer. And we biographers have a very dirty little secret, which is that we know we distort history a little bit. We make it seem like there's a guy or a gal who goes to a garage or a garret, and they have a light bulb moment and change happens, and innovation occurs. That's not the way it works. The way real innovation, real change, and real creativity work is through collaboration. And uh, I've learned that in all the uh, projects I've watched you all do. I've sat there in the hub, hearing people talking about their projects, and others come up to them and say, here's how I can help, or here's a way to make it, bring it into fruition. And by doing that, I can see the natural way that the Institute, but specifically this Global Leaders Network, has created uh, a sense of collaboration. And even here at the Institute, um, I kind of wander around and get sort of amazed at all the things happening here. And I realize that the one thing I've done was about 11 years ago, right after I was asked to be president of the Aspen Institute, somebody, Bill Mayer it was, said, you ought to have coffee with Peter Ryling because he's somebody doing something interesting. So we had coffee. I said, come here and start this. And it became a collaborative effort. So everything that happens at the Institute is because of people like Peter or Elliot or Amy or uh, everybody else who's been part of this collaborative process. Uh, and so that was the main thing I learned by coming here, was the value of collaboration. And it made me want to write a book that wasn't a biography. And so my latest book was about a series of unknown or little known people from, JC, from Ada Lovelace to J.C.R. Licklider, whose success became because they were collaborative leaders. And I thought in the few minutes I have, I'd just give seven of the lessons of people who have been great collaborative leaders. Uh, the first lesson comes from the notion of building the computer. The computer and the internet are the two most important inventions of our time. But with all due respect to Al Gore, we don't exactly know who invented them. And the reason is because it was collaborative leadership that invented them. Building the computer wasn't the tough part. Building the team that would build the computer was the tough part. And so sometimes, if you're a romantic biographer, you had to pick somebody who invented the computer. Some people pick out this guy, John Adonassoff, who was a professor at Iowa State. But he was very much a loner. And in the basement of the physics building there, he tried to do an electronic circuit that would do Boolean algebra. And whenever he had a problem he ran into, there was nobody he was collaborating with. He would take a long drive in his car, sometimes drive all the way to the Illinois border so that he could think. I also think he went to the Illinois border because you couldn't buy alcohol by the drink in Iowa and you could in Illinois. And he'd go sit in the bar right there on the border and try to work it through. Well, he got some of the things right, but by the time he gets called into the Navy in 1942, the punch card burners aren't working, the mechanics aren't working. He didn't have a team to help him execute. He had the vision, but vision without execution is just hallucination. And um, he didn't have a team, so he couldn't execute. He would have been lost to history were it not for somebody at the other end of that spectrum, somebody who was a great collaborative leader, a guy named John Mockley. And John Mockley, when he wanted to build a computer, realized that the first step was building the team. So he went traveling around. He went to Bell Labs and looked at what they were doing there, went to Harvard to see a mechanical machine that Grace Hopper and 
Howard Aiken were working on, went up to Dartmouth, went to the 1939 World's Fair in New York, and then even heard about this dude out in Iowa and drove all the way out to uh, Iowa to spend time with Adam Nassoff. Spent four days picking his brain, like a bumblebee picking up pollen. Adam Nassoff brought things together. Those of you who have built great businesses or great organizations probably have run into lawyers. And you know what happens next in this story. The intellectual property lawyers turned it into a 17-year intellectual property dispute as to whether or not Markley had stolen ideas from Adam Nassoff. But in the world of creativity, we don't call that stealing. We call it collaboration. <laughs> and in the end, Mockley gets credit for inventing ENIAC, bringing in six great women mathematicians to program it, bringing in Presper Eckert, who was a great uh, mechanical engineer whose grandfather invented a Turkish taffy machine. All these type of people he brought together so that a team of 80 could really execute on the computer. When I wrote about Steve Jobs near the end of his life, I asked him what I thought was a simple question, which is, what product are you most proud of inventing? He bit my head off, which happens often. He said, you haven't been listening to me. He said, building a product is hard. But what's really hard is building a team that will continue to great, make great products. So my most important product <clears throat> that I ever created <clears throat> was a team at Apple that keeps innovating, not, any, not the iPod or the iPhone or the iPad. Another lesson of all the people I've written about uh, is a lesson of humility. Peter Reiling said it at the very beginning in his opening speech that if you're going to be a good collaborator, it actually takes the virtue of humility. David Brooks has written an entire book on the virtue of humility, just came out, and uh, has written about it often. And it made me think back to old Ben Franklin, one of the people I had written about. Because um, Franklin, when he came to Philadelphia, he did something like this. He created the Leather Apron Club. It's like the Aspen Institute in a way. It was to discuss great issues, but then make action plans for how you were going to build a hospital or a lending library, or an academy for the education of youth, or a militia, whatever. All these collaborations that get put together because of his idea of civic leadership. I was telling David just a moment ago, if you read every one of the proposals for those, he always does it sort of under a pseudonym, one of his fake, you know, poor Richard or something. And he always gives credit to somebody else for the idea that maybe we need a volunteer fire corps. Because he said that to build collaboration, you always have to share credit and give other people credit. But, you know, he had trouble with that virtue of humility. With that leather apron club, it met every Friday in Philadelphia on round tables like this. And they made the list of virtues that you had to do to be a really great citizen. And they were the plain old virtues, you know, industry, honesty, frugality. Franklin's a geek, so he checks every week as he mastered each virtue. And at one point, he had mastered all 12 of the virtues. And he very proudly showed it to everybody in the club. <laughs> and a member of the club, as you might expect, said, hey, Franklin, you're missing a virtue you might want to try. <laughs> Franklin says, what's that? And the person says, Humility, you should add that one to your list. Now, the great thing about Franklin is that he's very honest in his letters to his sister and his autobiography. He said, I was never very good at the virtue of humility. I could never master it. But then he goes on and says, but I was very good at the pretense of humility. I could fake it very well. Now, that's good, but here's the true genius of Franklin. And he says, and I learned that the pretense of humility was just as useful as a reality of humility. <laughs> it made you listen to the person next to you, not try to judge their path, that they were doing good in this world, bring them together, and try to find the common ground with them. And that was the essence of the middle class type of democracy we were trying to form. You know, very rarely are the words Steve Jobs and humility used in the same sentence. But I thought about that. And I realized that even though he was rough on people, there were so many times when he gathered his great team together, and he told them what he wanted to do, and they pushed back. In fact, they used to give an award to the person 
who was best able to stand up to Steve that year. First three years, by the way, it was won by women. Uh, but Steve, you know, was a tough customer, but he knew how to realize that the people around him were sometimes smarter. One of the great and famous battles that lasted nine months was when the iPhone comes out and everybody on his team and everybody on his board wants to have third-party apps, wants you to be able to take out your iPhone and just click on it like that and you know, have different Ubers and everything else be there, thousands of apps that you can have. And Steve said, no, I don't want to pollute my phone with third-party apps. And they kept pushing back on him. And finally, the way he showed humility was he said, OK, you assholes. If you think you're so smart, just go ahead and do it. And they said, that's the way Steve surrendered on any argument. <laughs> Within a year, it's a $2 billion industry. And it also is a testament to the virtue of humility. You know, we were talking about this earlier and just passing, and I was, Skip came by going to the bathroom. We were talking about the dangers of people who sort of get on a high horse and say, this is the path, we have to do it, as opposed to the virtue of humility. And we recall that the last reading in the seminar often is the Isaiah Berlin reading, and Skip was able to quote it from heart to me about the danger of those who think that there's only one right path to the good life or the good universe or, or to helping others. And that if they believe that, they end up believing that there's a final solution to all the problems. Obviously, Berlin grew up in a particular place where the notion of a final solution was pretty tough. But the relative validity of the people's ideas at the table around you is a definition of humility. And as Isaiah Berlin said, that separates the barbaric from the civilized citizens. So thank you for reminding me of that. And that virtue of humility should be in part of all we do. Uh, another thing that was uh, an important uh, lesson of people who were collaborators and showed collaborative leadership was that they believed and appreciated diversity of talent. Uh, even back when they're trying to do the transistor at Bell Labs, it was a team that gets put together with people of all sorts of ideas and backgrounds. There's William Shockley, who's a real jerk, actually, uh, by the end of his life. But he was a great quantum theorist then. And they had John Bardeen, who had a physical background in certain types of quantum mechanics. But they also had Walter Bratton, who was an experimentalist and knew how to stick a paper clip into a piece of semiconducting ma material to get past the surface state. And they even had Alan Turing coming over from England with information theory. But they had pole climbers with grease under their fingernails who were trying to amplify phone signals as part of the team. And Soon, in the end, they create a transistor. Shockley was not very good at sharing the credit. Uh, he insisted he be in every picture of the team and be right in the center. And that's why they all broke off from eventually, and people like Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore, instead of working with him, ended up forming Intel. But Bob Noyce was the one who figured out that if you're going to be a team, you really have to share the credit. You have to have different types of people around you. I think that's one of our great problems in our age, is that the appreciation of diversity, I see John there from New Orleans and LaToya, the creativity of New Orleans has always come from its diversity. Louis Armstrong is a great example of that, where at a given moment you have uh, people from the sanctified church, freed slaves from the plantations coming into town, Congo Square where they're meeting. You have the French opera and the Creole Foxtrot orchestras and Scott Joplin coming down, decommissioned soldiers from uh, the Spanish-American War hawking their cornets in uh, the pawn shops. And then you have Louis Armstrong in the middle of all of this, getting one of those horns, listening to the opera, uh, being in Storyville where his mother uh, turned tricks and listening to Jelly Roll Morton play the piano. And jazz is born out of that diversity. We have, in the past 20 or 30 years, become a society that's actually had less diversity, whether it's in the technology industry, whether it's in everything we do in life, whether it's in the dinners we go to. And I think that if we're going to be, in terms of collaboration and creativity, we have to reassert that every day we're going to do things to help improve the diversity of all the groups uh, that we gather. Another lesson is that it tends to be place-based. Uh, Steve Jobs was very insistent that uh, 
people come to work, that they have a big atrium in the Pixar building, that the new Apple headquarters will be in the round. So people will serendipitously run into each other. That's what you see here at the hub or other things. Uh, when Peter and I were first working on the AGLN, he said, we have to have our own social networking app. And you know, we spent a lot of money and some time doing it. Finally tried Facebook and to use it as a, but you know what? Virtual networks don't quite work as well as place-based things. It's why Marissa Mayer told people at Yahoo, you actually have to come in. And I think that there is a value of face-to-face -face human communication in a digital age. Um, in terms of giving credit and being more willing to give credit than take it, another lesson, I was really impressed with the Charleston panel. Because when they decided they wanted the flag taken down, there was nobody barging out in the lead to be in, taking the credit or leading the charge. They did it collaboratively, and only through that did it work. It was a very moving panel. I noticed, too, that uh, sometimes when you have that type of collaboration, it's tricky, but it works with competition as well, that you can be competitors, but competitors who also know how to respect and collaborate. Bob Noyce, who created Intel, got into one of those with Jack Kilby, who was at Texas Instruments. They were both racing to create the microchip, taking those transistors and etching many of them on a chip of silicon. In some ways, they both invented around the same time. Their lawyers start suing each other. They call each other up, say, call off the lawyers. We both did this. Let's cross-license it. And Noyce dies, but when Kilby is given the uh, Nobel Prize, his first thing when he's told about it is that if Noyce were still alive, he'd be sharing this with me. Uh, he loved sharing credit and loved that notion of humility that comes from that. When the Swedish scientist gives Kilby the award in the white tie ceremony, and talks about the entire digital revolution comes down to this thing that you invented. You've changed our lives on this, that, and the other. Kilby gets up and just ad libs. That reminds me of something that uh, the beaver said to the rabbit at the foot of the Hoover Dam. No, I didn't actually build it, but it's based on my idea. Um, <laughs> and in terms of noble competition, one of them happened exactly 100 years ago this month when Albert Einstein was about to develop the greatest theory in the history of science, general relativity. And he went up to Göttingen, where David Hilbert, the great mathematician, was there, and they kicked around the ideas. They shared ideas on it. And then Hilbert tried to race Einstein in terms of coming up with the mathematical equations that would express it. In some ways, in the same week, in November of 1915, 100 years ago, they come up with those equations. Uh, and uh, there was sort of a battle then, especially because Einstein was Jewish, and the Germans weren't sure they wanted to give credit to him. And so Hilbert says, no, it was Einstein's theory. We collaborated on it, but he should get credit for the theory. And right afterwards, Einstein nominates uh, Hilbert for one of the most prestigious academies there. So competition and collaboration working together was also a secret. And the final one, since I'm ending my time, is that it's peer-to-peer. -peer. It's not top-down. We are not going to tell you how to leave this action form and what action to take. This is a peer-to-peer -peer group here, and the whole digital revolution is peer-to-peer, -peer, not command structure where people say, and here's what you should now do. When they were inventing the internet, it was to bring together a lot of research computers and the Defense Department, which was funding them, wanted a network that would allow uh, them to interact, share computing power. And being great research universities, they did what research professors always do. They delegated to their graduate students the task of figuring out how this network would work. So 30 graduate students started meeting, place-based meetings. They'd go from place to place every six months to come up with the protocols that would show how a packet switch network would work. Well, you had no central hub. You had no uh, even regional hubs the way an airline does. Each and every node of the internet, they decided, would have equal power to store and forward packets. And uh, in order to make it a collaborative effort, they didn't even want to hand down rules and regulations. They made the youngest of the graduate students, a guy named Steve Crocker, take notes. And he wrestled with, what do we call these protocols or things? And finally, he decided to call them requests for comment. 
because it was a way to make it seem the most collaborative. So every single one of the rules of the road of the internet showing how a packet will be addressed or how it recombines or how a transmission control tells you where, it, you know, if something's missing, all came with RFCs, requests for comment. Now that's pretty cool, but even cooler is the fact that that's still how the internet's being built. We're up to 7,927 in the RFC process. We still call it request for comment. There's nobody in charge. And the fingerprints of that type of collaboration, of that, what they built, the DNA is inbred in the internet. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer type of um, uh, uh, collaboration. We had Time Magazine in the 1990s wrote they did it that way so that it would survive a Russian nuclear attack. Uh, because you take out one node, it just writes routes around it as opposed to having a central switch. We got a letter from Steve Crocker, who I'd never heard of, saying, no, no, that's not why we did it. Hey, we were graduates. We were all dodging the draft. We weren't trying to do things with the Pentagon. We did it so that we could all be in control. We could all collaborate instead of having a top-down hierarchical structure. Time was very arrogant back then. I know, because I was there. And uh, so we didn't print the letter. We said we had a better source. I had forgotten about this until I interviewed Steve for the book. I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. And so I called Nancy Gibbs, the editor of Time. I said, have somebody, if you would, go to the files and archives and find out who that better source was. It was a guy named um, Steve Lukasich, who actually ran ARPA, the place in the Pentagon that was funding this. And he said, yeah, we were doing it to survive a Russian attack. We didn't tell the graduate students that. They were all draft dodgers. But, you know, <laughs> that's how we got money out of the Pentagon, you know? It wasn't so that they could play video games on distant computers. Uh, and so he said to me, you tell Steve Crocker that, you know, he was on the bottom and I was on the top. So he didn't know what was happening. And I told Crocker that. I went to a COSI out in Bethesda where he lives. He stroked his chin. He said, you tell the Kasich, he was on the top and I was on the bottom. So he didn't know what was happening. <laughs> and that is the nature of collaborative creativity in the digital age. I'll leave you just with one further thought, I know my time is up, is that all of these people I talked about, an essence to their belief in collaboration was that it was about something larger than themselves. It wasn't just them. In the summer of 2011, when Steve Jobs was, you know, losing his race to cancer, I went out and said, what is it you've learned from all this? What, was, what do you feel, you know, your mission was? What was the purpose of it all? And he said, I studied Zen Buddhism, and I learned that history is like a river and life is like a river. You get to take things out of the river that really wonderful people before you invented. You get to take their ideas, you get to take the devices they invented, you get to take all sorts of theories and wonderful organizations they created. You get to take so many things out of the river. He said, but I've now come to realize that what life is all about is not how much you got to take out of the river, but how much you got to put into the river. Those little things you might have put in the river that a few years from now, a few decades from now, a century from now, people might say, that was cool, somebody put that in the river before me. As for Einstein, his wonderful theory of relativity that he and Hilbert did somewhat collaboratively was, as I said, the greatest theory in the history of science. But it has one flaw. The flaw is that when it rubs up against the other theory that Einstein came up with in the last century, quantum theory, it doesn't quite mesh. Right at the intersection of relativity and quantum, it doesn't quite work. There's an uncertainty uncertainty principle, things seem to happen by chance. Einstein was very spiritual. He always said, I cannot believe God would play dice with the universe. As God. And so on his deathbed, for 30 years, he had been working on a unified field theory that would try to tie it all together. And on his deathbed, his last day, he had an aneurysm that burst. He asked Helen Duke as his secretary to bring him his papers. So after everybody left at 9 p.m., the Princeton Hospital, he spends the next few hours writing nine more pages, line after line of equations on the unified field theory that he thought would just get him and the rest of us one step closer to that spirit manifest in the laws of the universe. And you see the last line dribble off as he dies. And as for Franklin, he donated to the building fund of each and every church that was built in Philadelphia. 
And um, at one point, they were building a new hall to the left of Independence Hall. It's still there. It's still called the New Hall. And on the fundraising document, he said, even if the Mufti of Constantinople were to send somebody here to preach Islam to us and to teach us about the Prophet Muhammad, we should offer them a pulpit and we should listen for we might learn something. And on his deathbed, he was the largest individual contributor to the Mikveh Israel Synagogue, the first synagogue built in Philadelphia. So when he died, instead of his minister accompanying his casket to the grave, all 35 ministers, preachers, and priests uh, linked arms with the rabbi of the Jews in Philadelphia to march with him to the grave. It was that type of larger collaboration, believing you're part of something larger than yourselves, that people from different backgrounds and different approaches and different ways of doing good should all work together. That was what they were fighting for back then, 250 years ago, and is what we're still fighting for, not only around the world, but very much so here at home in America. Thank you all very much. It is now my pleasure to, from my table, hear some of the amazing action pledges, uh, introduce some of the amazing people who can do some action pledges. Um, my name is Emil Kibesi. I'm a Middle East Leadership Fellow from Jordan and managing partner of Silicon Badia. My action pledge is to, by 2018, train and empower 80 civil servants to drive tangible new policy initiatives that positively transform the lives of citizens. Thank you. My name is Sarah Menker. I am an African Leadership Initiative East Africa Fellow and CEO of Grow Intelligence. My action pledge is to assist 2,000 small and medium enterprises in managing the profitability of their agricultural businesses by granting free access to data analytics and content about markets that they are exposed to, as well as training on how to use the data. My name is Leon Chung. I'm a China Fellow and an Executive Director of the Hong Kong Jockey Club <coughs> Charities Trust and I'm the last man between you and your email. <laughs> My action pledge is to expand Run Our City, a social enterprise building youth confidence and stamina through running from Hong Kong to a national level. Thank you. As you all have heard, uh, Linda and Stuart Resnick are the people who helped fu uh, fund and put this whole thing, make this whole thing possible. They also are wonderful uh, leaders of the agricultural community uh, in California. And they really have taken the spirit of collaborative leadership we've talked about. In the Central Valley of California, if you're talking about places where there's some deep problems, uh, that's where they've begun to work, not just uh, trying to do good there, but to collaborate there, to work with each person there, to understand uh, through listening the needs of the people there. And so um, I have asked, and we've, uh, Peter and I have asked Linda to come talk a little bit about the type of collaboration she has formed in the Central Valley of California. My friend Linda Resnick, and thanks for all you do, Linda. I'm humbled to have to speak after Walter. He had three little lines handwritten on a piece of paper. I have a speech. <laughs> I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Five years ago, I had an epiphany right here at the Aspen Institute. I think my epiphanies always happen at the Aspen Institute. It's just the way it goes here. Um, but this was a really meaningful thing for me because I realized that instead of investing, which we had been, in other people's visions of charity, that I really had to start doing the work myself. I had to get in the field, and I had to get my hands dirty, and I had to see what people had, were dealing with in their lives. And I didn't have to look far, because the Central Valley of California is where our crops grow, and that is where I saw the most need and where we should go. I never forget for one moment that it is only luck and privilege that separates me from the people that we serve. 
we're all the same. That's the one thing I have realized. Um, let me introduce you to the wonderful company. Our products are real food, unprocessed, natural, and nutritious. For Stuart and myself, being wonderful goes beyond consumer uh, promise. It also extends to our philanthropic activities. Our main focus is investing in the communities where our employees live and work, and that is the Central Valley. The story I'll tell you today fits perfectly into the 2015 Aspen Action Forum with this year's theme of collaborative leadership. I'll show you how our team works with the communities we serve to solve critical issues in their lives. And the thing, I guess, about this work that surprised me the most was how our executives really embraced the work in spite of the fact that it gave them extra work to do. They were so enthusiastic. And of course, that was the only way any of it could happen. Many people have asked me, what is the Central Valley? Where is the Central Valley? It's in California. It's 45,000 square miles with 6.5 million people. It is the heart of our state. It is where 50% of the fruits, vegetables, and nuts that we in America consume every day are grown. It also is the home of the majority of our workforce. So we placed a great deal of importance on establishing extensive community development, outreach programs, and educational initiatives across the region. We are trying in our way to transform the cycle of poverty and neglect that has plagued this region for decades. After visiting several small towns in the region, we picked the little hamlet of Lost Hills to start our community development work. I hadn't done my own philanthropy before, and I wanted to start small. And um, the wonderful pistachio plant is 13 miles from this little community. But otherwise, it was lost, forgotten by county, state, and federal government. Their community park was dilapidated and unsafe. They didn't have street lights or any basic infrastructure. And most important, the children had nowhere to go after school to play, and the schoolyard closed at 2.45 in the afternoon. In business, before we go to market, we do market research to understand if our product or service is relevant to our consumers. I believe that philanthropy is no different. I didn't know any other way to start except to build our work on the wants and needs of the people we were serving. So we started with focus groups. And then to verify our findings, we went door to door to every single house, except for the two meth labs um, <laughs> in Lost Hills. The, uh, we were afraid. The, <laughs> the community's first request was to put lights on the basketball court, because the kids would back up their cars and turn the lights on so they could play basketball at night. But we didn't stop there. Today, the wonderful park has two community centers, two soccer fields. By the way, they won the soccer champion, uh, championship, volleyball courts, and everything a playground needs to make kids happy and engaged. We offer English as a second language classes, summer camps, after school activities, Zumba, martial arts, computer science, ballet, voter registration, and so forth. The scope of our improvement projects which reaches well beyond the park. We also paved the roads, put in sidewalks, bus shelters, street lights, and storm drains, and planted drought resistant, which we really need these days, landscaping. And all this working side by side with the citizens of Lost Hills. In a joint project with the USDA, we helped build 82 affordable, single family, three bedroom homes and apartments and the rents start from $350 a month to $700, depending on how much the agricultural worker makes. These will be ready for occupancy in February of, of next year. And working with Angela Soto, who previously had a food truck, we helped finance and build Gabby's, the town's first restaurant, which officially opens its doors later this month. And I will tell you, it is the best hockey you've ever had in your life. <laughs> Along the way, during this four-year period, we reduced crime 50 to 60 percent. 
We helped return analyze, annualized benefits of 200,000 200, to 500,000 in county taxes back to the community. They never got a dime of the taxes that were paid, and now they do. But most important, we've helped establish a community advisory group, and these are local residents that are learning empowerment so that they can run their town, and they will very soon. It will become an incorporated town. But the work in Lust Hills taught me that without education, all our good work might not be sustainable. So over the last three and a half years, we began our education programs in earnest under the leadership of Noemi Denoso, stand up, honey, and her great team. <laughs> she is part of the Farah Education Fellowship, and not only is Noemi here with us, but um, a lot of the leaders of the Central Valley are here also, and I'm sure you've met them in your travels. You want to stand up, guys, and say hi? <laughs> These are our partners in the Central Valley. Last year we brought a cohort, and this year we have another cohort and so forth. We hope every year we can do that because uh, we want them to get the value of the Aspen education the way we have. Through the wonderful program, we've reached 55,000 students at 58 schools in 18 districts, and we've already awarded 1,500 college scholarships and incentives, as, way, as well as 1,300 teacher grants. And we've accomplished this with a contract between the parents, the children, and the schools. But I think what I'm most proud of is our wonderful agricultural career prep. This is a program that prepares students for careers in the new ag, which is highly technical and STEM-oriented. By creating a collaboration between regional community colleges, high schools, and our company as the industry partner. During an innovative, rigorous four-year academic track, each student and their fellow co cohorts do more than meet high school graduation requirements. They take college courses given by college professors, earning them college credit. So when they graduate from high school, they have an AA degree in agriculture, and they can either go to a four-year school and enter as a junior and finish in half the time, or they enter our skilled ag workforce and get an entry-level job at thirty dollars to $50,000 a year. We also operate two preschools with two more on the way. We put art education in 11 schools. We have 26 summer camps in a place that never had summer camps before. And um, most importantly, the parents uh, go to classes from preschool all the way through high school and learn to connect the dots between education and their kids' future. Uh, we also have our own um, uh, wonderful College Prep Academy, founded in 2009. There's only two charter schools in our part of the Central Valley. But as one thing leads to another, our efforts have given us a unique window into our employees' lives. And we've become more and more involved with their families and their communities, and we realized that they had a lack of focus on their general wellness and basic health needs. This is a region of the state that has an epidemic of obesity and diabetes. Look at the numbers. These are taken from a survey of our employees. 11% have diabetes, 49% are pre-diabetic. That's 60% of our employees, 20% higher than California's rate. But what we just found out is that 86% are pre-diabetic or diabetic by the time they reach their 50s. As for obesity, 34% are overweight and 43% are classified as obese, and so on. And when you add to this the increased cases of high blood pressure and high cholesterol, it is a pretty grim picture for health. In an attempt a few years ago to help this problem, uh, we went and hired an outside clinic provider uh, to serve the 7,800 uh, employees and their families in the Valley. However, we discovered that they weren't using the clinics, our employees, and only 30% of the appointments were taken. So recently, we went directly to the employees, and we held 13 focus groups with men, women, couples, um, 
and supervisors, 150 people, and we spent an hour and a half with each focus group, and we managed to get to the root of the issues pretty quickly. Problem number one, our healthcare provider wasn't doing a good job. The staff wasn't bilingual. Um, everyone in the Central Valley speaks Spanish, I think, is their first language. The clinic hours weren't convenient, the doctor was only available one day a week, and the turnover rate was so high they couldn't build um, a feeling of collaboration with their providers. And even more distressing, many patients were sent away untreated, and everything from flu shots to shortness of breath to severe chest pains. Medications weren't dispensed on site, and they didn't understand what was wrong with them. Uh, they weren't getting a clear definition of their health concerns. So we asked in the focus groups, how would you describe a healthy person? And they said, if you're able to work, you're healthy. You only go to a doctor if you're sick, and a healthy person doesn't need a doctor. But really, the most important thing to the people of the Central Valley is their family. And one of the reasons we've been successful with some of our programs there is because the family unit is so tight uh, that they really look out for each other. Um, but they also, our employees, were absolutely uh, sure that their children would get their flu shots, their checkups every year. And I'd ask them, why can't you love yourself half as much as you love your kids? Or if your car was having trouble, would you take it to the garage for maintenance? And yes, of course they would. Well, think of your body as a machine. If it doesn't run, you can't work or help those you love. And then we asked, what are the most common diseases that you experience in your family? And of course, they were the diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. Our employees know they're at risk. So naturally, we asked, why don't you go to, uh, to a doctor? And what we discovered is they think it's inevitable that they'll get sick. And so they don't feel empowered to change. They're afraid to find out, as many of us are, through a checkup that something else might be wrong. I'm sure you could relate to that. So if there's no roadmap to wellness and no one in your corner to guide you to be your champion, it can be overwhelming to figure out how to do it on your own. And then lastly, we asked them, what are the main barriers to leading a healthy lifestyle? And of course, the issues are time and stress and a long commute and their fear of losing money by missing work. Uh, men said that they would work through sickness and pain so they wouldn't have to take time off. Of course, we've changed all that. We've encouraged them to visit the clinic whenever they're sick and not to worry and they would never lose pay. They live on a tight budget and they have poor eating habits, lack of exercise, and a genetic predisposition to obesity and diabetes. And after a long, tiring work day, who wants to exercise or take that extra step to be healthy? And the Valley folks, like the rest of us, get too little sleep, so any additional task seems insurmountable. So what to do? We need to show our employees that they are empowered to make the changes that are necessary in their lives. And um, that involves three areas, the relaunch of our wellness clinics, the workplace outreach, and community outreach. So this is our road to Wellville. We are expanding our clinics in both areas. We will have new staff, extra exam rooms, and separate waiting rooms for the children. All this with more of a focus on wellness and a commitment to our employees and their families. Here's our new staffing model. Each clinic will have a full-time on-site physician and a nurse practitioner, as well as psychiatric social workers. We will have health coaches that will be assigned a full caseload of patients. That means that every employee that comes into the clinic will have someone on their team to advocate for them every step of the way. Free prescriptions given on site, and of course, fully bilingual. We wanna give people the tools to make positive change in their lives. Wellness also has to be ubiquitous at work and at home and in the community. So workplace outreach. We're training our supervisors to reinforce, reinforce health and wellness as part of a daily work routine. We've built stretching and walking activities into each shift on the factory floor. We have fully equipped gyms on site. Employee ambassadors have been identified among the workforce to help motivate their fellow colleagues 
every day, and they act as collaborators with us on our new health, health in initiatives and feedback on how our programs are working on a day-to-day -day basis. At every break on the factory floor, our employees are given free healthy snacks, nuts, and fruit, and our cafes have more um, affordable healthy options with an all-you-can-eat salad bar with protein for two bucks. And the final component of our three-tier strategy is community outreach. And we realize that people live far away and their kids couldn't come into the clinic, so we have to go out to the communities. And um, these satellite uh, locations, uh, we will find promotoros or health promoters within the community to inspire and motivate the people on their personal lives in the towns where they actually live. And we will um, establish exercise programs, fitness challenges, health education, wellness workshop, nutritional cooking, and so forth. There's a lot of work to be done and an aggressive timeline to do it in. As you've seen, we're implementing what we can along the way, and our goal is to have our new clinics open in October. So here is my action pledge. We are deeply committed to effecting a positive and meaningful change in this area, and here is what I promise to do. I pledge to create and implement a holistic approach to wellness and health with a clearly defined roadmap for our employees and their families in the Central Valley of California. I further pledge to reduce incidents of obesity, disease, and stress in their lives, and your prayers would be most welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Linda has offered to take some questions. Uh, Linda, thank you so much for that presentation, and really congratulations to you and to Stuart, and to thank you and for to all you're doing, and to the entire team, as well as to all those here who are collaborating in this venture from the Central Valley. We're delighted to have you all here. So if there are any questions in the floor, uh, Linda's offered to answer them. Uh, feel free. Yes, Shamina. Thank you. How can I judge people that are happier than most of my friends? Hi, I'm David Lowe from the Teacher Leader Cohort. Um, so I don't have really much of a business connection, but I was just curious how much of the cost or any of the process was sort of built into the business model as opposed to the philanthropic model of your family donations. You know, Stuart wanted to know that too. Um, <laughs> uh, we kind of just, uh, I'm so bad with budgets. Anyway, now we have one. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, this whole effort started so small, and, and it's still small compared to our global business, um, but it's meaningful. And um, now we have a proper budget, and we're running it uh, in, you know, like a business. Right, honey? <laughs> I believe in collaboration, but he's the boss. No. And if you believe that, I'll sell you a bridge in Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, 
We have, a, we have a strong belief in you can do well by doing good, or you can do good by doing well, I forget. Anyway, and uh, this is very much focused on the communities that our employees live in, and very much focused on our employees. And we believe that, uh, when, particularly when it gets to the health aspect, that there's all sorts of costs related to poor health. We think that they, we will see a benefit from that. My hope is, is that this really doesn't become a charity, but rather works, and that we will get a payback. We're not doing it for the payback because we can spread it out to others. We can be the example that says, look, here's some of the things one can do, and we have to, you have to pay for the um, employee's insurance anyway. So our out-of-pocket costs for health insurance in the Valley is something like 40 to $50 million a year. So we have a pretty big budget to work with to reduce, and, have the, and, and so it's a win-win. We believe that the employees will um, appreciate what we're doing, have an opportunity. They don't have the opportunity to learn. I mean, look, this group here, everyone knows, if you're overweight or obese, you pretty well know what to do about it. Uh, and this group doesn't look overweight or obese. It's very impressive, yeah. <laughs> but if you're in the Central Valley and you don't have an education, you don't even know what to do. So by teaching them, we think we can get some really big impact. And then when it gets to education, uh, we need a sustainable workforce in the Valley. We, we, we're expanding business, and uh, the, the work gets more and more sophisticated. So therefore, again, we believe that there will be a payback. So. What it's going to cost, um, I can't tell you, but we believe that it'll be a worthwhile effort even from the corporate standpoint, that it's not just charity. I don't believe in charity. I believe in philanthropy, but that's another story. Thank you both for all that you're doing, both in the Central Valley and to support this network. Um, I'm a resident of Los Angeles, and I spend um, far too much time driving up I-5 to the San Francisco Bay Area, so I see a lot of what's transpiring in the region. And this is a little bit off topic, but I'm wondering how you're thinking about water for your businesses. Yeah, well, I figured that would come up. Um, we're thinking about water 24-7, okay? I don't want to get into a drought discussion right now because it really is off topic, but it is serious, and a lot of people have suffered. I think we'll be okay if El Nino is delivered, and I think it will. So um, it's a tough time for people with no rain, but you know our climate is in terrible jeopardy, but we don't want to go there right now. We all know that, right? Well, thank you, John Wood, um, Henry Crown Fellow. Um, thank you for this, because it's, uh, we were talking earlier about how sometimes at Aspen, you can go down a rat hole and people talk about all the problems and all the things that aren't going right and all, and we talk about it, and then you end up leaving a discussion. You, un you wanted to feel enlightened when you left and you, and you kind of just gone down a rat hole into people talking about all the problems. And so this is a great case, I think, of, of enlightened capitalism. I would love to see some kind of like giving pledge type thing where more, more business leaders would agree to emulate your approach. And so I don't have a question. I just had a suggestion is I would love, 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 love to see you do this as a TED talk. <laughs> I, I think, think if, I know them too if well. If several thousand <laughs> business leaders, Linda, were to be inspired by this, then uh, your you. ripple effect would be unbelievable. So I apologize I didn't have a question, but it's kind of a request and an idea. You know, I'm, I'm very and If anybody shy. thinks that would be a good idea, maybe symbolize oh. that by... I, I, I'm very shy about going public. I mean, I feel safe here at the Aspen Institute because, you know, I've been on the board for 11 years, and, uh, but I don't go public with the work we do. Um, when our results are really as profound as they should be, then maybe we'll talk about it. Arturo yeah. Condo? Thanks a lot, Linda, and thanks a lot for, I, I think it's interesting the systemic approach you've taken and how you end up like really attacking problems in a, in a comprehensive way. 
My concern would be, what happens if, for instance, you sell the company, right? Uh, a new management comes in or new ownership comes in. Uh, what are you thinking for the future? I mean, how to make this sustainable, not only financially, but you know, in, in, a, in a kind of in a self-operating mode? You mentioned about the advisory or the steering group. What, what, what's your thinking? Yes, our employees ask us every day, what if you die? <laughs> so um, I'm sure that was a nice way of you saying the same thing. Uh, <laughs> Yes, um, you know, you can't, you can't work from the grave, but we hope that we have created a company and a philosophy and um, that understands, I mean, everyone at the company, even in Los Angeles and in Fiji and around the globe, wherever we are, loves the work that we're doing and they all do in their communities what they can. And I think it's just part of our corporate culture right now. I know corporate is an ugly word, but we are a corporation, and, and it is our culture uh, giving back, and I don't think that will ever go away. Any others? Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. I am Bongiwe from South Africa, and I'm an agricultural activist. So I was fascinated with the high level of technology that you're using to train the people, and I just wondered, how does this translate then into your new varietal development or new product? I'm sorry, into... How does it translate into the advancement of the business in terms of design of new products or development of new products? Because you're training people with high tech in agri... Well, agricultural, I'm assuming biotechnology, and I just wanted to know how deliberately you use that capacity to improve your own products. What? Am I... I, I'm, I don't really understand your question. Okay. Stuart understands it. <laughs> That's why we're a partnership. We're, we're in the permanent crop business. So we're not in the, the developing of new products. Our whole focus is on, God does it. on uh, how can we use, for example, less water, less inputs, and get better yields. So that's the focus that we have. So we work in those areas primarily. Now, we'll train um, young kids for other jobs, and there may be some opportunities. We're, we're well, not, they, they learn yeah. plant science, and yeah. they, they learn uh, robotics and, and all sorts of things. And, but really, we're only tree crops. We have 20 million trees in the Central Valley growing pistachios, almonds, and pomegranates. Should we take one more? Uh, Sarah Borgman from the Skoll Foundation. Thank you, Linda, for sharing that. And I just have one quick question, um, really quick. Would you consider becoming a B Corp after learning what you've learned at Aspen this week? That is a great question. And as I was sitting here uh, the other day at lunch and hearing about the B Corp, I thought, well, maybe we would fit into that. Um, and sure, why not? Great. So again, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, it is uh, 2.17, so we've got some time now. Uh, let's just enjoy ourselves. We have our next seminar starting up in a couple minutes, and I just got a text that uh, Dele Olojede has challenged Arjun Gupta to a dance-off tonight on top of the mountain. We all look forward to it. <laughs>